Okay, Mr. Mayor, we are live on YouTube if you want to begin the meeting. And Dr. Mokaber, I made you a, a co-host so that... Good morning, everyone. Uh, I now call to order the um, August 14th Review of School Committee, Committee of the Whole. Uh, roll call the members. Mrs. Bronston Rizzo. Here. Mr. D'Ambrosio. Here. Mr. Ferranti. Here. Ms. Gravelisi. Here. Mr. Sanella. Ms. Ty. Carol, you need to unmute. Here. <laughs> Mayor Rigo. Here. Uh, we'll start today's meeting with uh, public speak. Uh, Dr. Kelly, I don't know if there's anyone in the uh, chat or uh, any participants who are looking to say anything. We would um, ask any participant if they are interested in saying anything to please raise your hand. Uh, when you address the school committee, please um, please give us your full name and uh, and address for. Uh, for our record, and I see a couple of hands going up. Mm -hmm. So I, the first one is um, Tommy Dole. Um. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Um, do I need uh, Do I need video, or is this okay the way it is? Um. Nope. I, I think it's okay. I don't know how to put your video on. Can you put yeah. it on? I don't see the option, so I will just talk. Okay. Um, hello, distinguished members of the school committee. My name is Shami Goel. I reside on Dunster Lane in Winchester, Massachusetts. I'm here to express my concerns about the return to school buildings for ELL, EC, and SPED students. As I understand, this is the current plan for the upcoming academic year. I've worked for the Revere Public Schools as a special education educator my entire career. I'm also the mother of two school-age children. I'm speaking today as a parent who is also a teacher. I agree kids, especially mine, need to go back to school. And in theory, in-person learning for smaller groups of high-need children sounds like the best way to be educated. However, as a teacher, I quickly see how different this will look from school as we know it. Returning to school in the midst of a pandemic is not a return to the routine that our kids know and expect. One of the first things I, like all other teachers do in September, is work on building relationships. My children that I work with are young. Crafts, games, sharing toys, high fives, hand holding, hugs, lots of smiles. All of this will be taken away from them. We will not be sharing in the block area, working on a puzzle with a friend, or playing a game of Candyland. I'll be sitting six feet, six feet away from my students who will also be six feet from each other, maybe separated by shields or shower curtains. Since I work with young children and those that require full hand over hand assistance to complete tasks, I will be wearing full PPE, either supplied by the school or purchased on my own. I will look scary. Kids won't see my face. They won't know when I'm smiling. They won't see me encouraging them and they won't see my expressions because I'll be behind a mask and goggles. I also won't be able to see their expressions. I won't know when they're confused. I don't know when they're bored. Any indication that I would get from their expression will be gone. I also work with children on social skills. How do I do this when there is no group work, project, or shared activities? How much learning can occur when children are glued to their seats in the same space for hours at a time? The best part of the day for kids my own included, is lunch, recess, gym, and art. It is when they can be kids and play with their friends while engaging in hands-on learning, using the skills we work on in therapy in real life situations. But now kids won't be playing on the playground or sharing stories over lunch. Um, I've done breakfast and lunch duty now for almost 20 years, and I know kids like to talk, and this is one of the few opportunities they have to do it. Prior to COVID, there are already so few opportunities for socialization built into the school day. Now the opportunities that once were there will be gone. 
I am fearful that a return to poorly vented school buildings that lacked adequate cleaning supplies prior to the pandemic will result in illness. I've been collecting PPE and Lysol wipes all summer, but I don't have enough for the 50 or so kids that I see to last more than a few weeks. If we open up school buildings in one of the hardest hit areas in the state, kids will get sick. Families will get sick, teachers will get sick. We are not stopping the spread. I'm nervous I don't know how to deal with the trauma that will come from seeing so many people no longer with us or the anxiety that will come from waiting for another abrupt shutdown. I'm nervous my students will sense my fear. I don't know how to make them feel safe. I don't feel safe. With good professional development, I have and will continue to be better at distance learning. I can learn to effectively teach remotely, but I'm not sure I can effectively teach well. Thank you for your time. Uh, the next person is uh, Olga. Mm. And I would just, I, uh, Olga, before you begin, I, I apologize for cutting in. I just want to remind folks because I did see a number of hands go up as well um, that we'd really appreciate um, keeping remarks to three minutes um, or under three minutes. Um, I know that's uh, can be difficult, uh, especially given uh, the topic, but uh, I, I do, I do want to be mindful of everybody's time. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Dr. Kelly. Good morning, everyone. I'll be brief. Um, um, I, got, I got some questions about reopening for the special needs kids. Um, and I'm talking about my kids. Some of them need extra support. Some of them are considered special need kids. And I don't feel safe sending my kids to school right now. Um, prior to COVID, my kids will come rushing to the bathroom because they were not able to use the bathroom at school. They were, um, there was no toilet paper, no soap for hand washing, and the bathrooms were disgusting. I don't know if now with COVID time will be different. Who's gonna be assuring that my kids can go and clean their hands every time? And um, in my experience, uh, the kids with special needs, they need breaks. They need, the, the it's required for the teachers to let them fidget in, to let them stand out from their seat, get close, and they're forgetful. They forget about the rules. They forget about the guidance. So I don't feel safe they're going back to school when the COVID great it's every day we see the cases so i just really wanted to make sure that you're thoughtful about it and the i know it's a challenge from home it, it's and i hope it's you guys spend time on planning a good um you know system with more support with more materials to engage these kids and keep everybody safe i mean if it is not safe for one why is this group of people of students are gonna be exposing themselves to, to the virus and bring it back home to us. They're being stuck at home for the longest time. Um, that's my only concern, my only question. Um, and yes, I will. And thank you for allowing me to speak. Um, the next one is, um, it just says Miller. Um, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Good morning. My name is Heather Miller. I live on S Street in Haverhill and I teach second grade at the Garfield Elementary School. I've been with the Riviera Public Schools for 13 years. I'm speaking this morning regarding the return to the school plan. Mayor Rigo announced his plan that Revere would be returning to school remotely in the fall. However, the new plan for some of the Revere public schools to return contradicts what was previously announced. This is deeply concerning to me. My understanding of remote learning is that no students and teachers return to the buildings. In some of the school plans, upwards of 170 students and more than two dozen teachers would be entering a building every day. 
That's too many people given the current pandemic and COVID rate in Revere, which has been ranked a red zone by the Commonwealth. In addition to the spike we are facing, there are logistical nightmares that come along with a return to school, such as getting children in and out of the building, lunch, bathroom breaks, keeping masks on students, the sneezing, coughing, vomiting, and those are just a handful. More importantly, at the elementary level, we are still talking about young children, children who still need hugs, children who still cry, children who are still babies. How am I supposed to look at a student crying and not console them? As a teacher of young children, this is a critical part of building relationships with students. This pandemic reaches farther than the borders of Revere. The teachers working in Revere come from almost 100 different communities within the Commonwealth, many of them considered hotspots on Governor Baker's reports. How are we going to be able to lower the infection rates when this type of transient behavior is happening daily? Speaking of transient behavior, the students often move between cities. The majority of the cities these students move in and out of are also read on the governor's infection list. In addition to these concerns, we are now within a few weeks of starting school. We are running out of time and there are still so many unanswered questions. How is it decided who teaches remotely and who doesn't? Who gets to decide if my personal situation is more important than another teacher's? What happens if a child in my classroom gets sick? Do we all have to quarantine? What if the fam one of the family members of that child gets sick? Do we all have to quarantine? What if the child has siblings in our building? Do those grade levels quarantine? Will the, city, will the city be handling contact tracing if any of these events occur or will it just be too late? The list goes on and on. I believe that at this time, we need to turn our attention to a fully remote, high quality learning plan for our students. That it should be our priority. Thank you for allowing me to speak today. I believe that the next person is um, Frank Collins. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hello, distinguished members of the school committee. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak. My name is Frank Collins and I reside at 30 Floor Lab in Malden and I teach at the beach. On March 12th, we received word that we'd, be, we'd begin online learning for two weeks. Closure extended into the end of April and ultimately the end of the school year, including an extended school year for students. I teach a first grade I teach a first grade small learning group for students with autism spectrum disorder. I love my job and my students. I love seeing the incremental, consistent gains. What might seem like an easy task for some is an enormous hurdle for my students. This includes opening food packages by themselves, holding a the pencil correctly, using the bathroom independently or following a two-step direction without adult prompting or support. But when I was told I had to do this all online, I was I was worried. But we as a team stepped up to, my, to the plate. My paraprofessionals, I have no idea where I'd be without them. They led individual work sessions with students. They checked in with students who were struggling behaviorally. They jumped on Zoom sessions over the summer when they were not provided the, an opportunity to work just to keep their kids. I commend their work ethic and support them without regard. Our related service providers and EL teachers, they met with students in small groups individually and in whole groups. Each time I was amazed at the tasks that they created that kept students consistently engaged even, more, even through a video. They met with parents and created asynchronous lessons for parents to work with, with our students outside the Zoom session. But the biggest success was, but the biggest success was the parents and students themselves. I know as a teacher for children with behavioral difficulties that online learning would be difficult. Was it perfect? No. But were games made? Absolutely. I can confidently say that each of my students made adequate progress over the course of the past five months of online learning. We talked about social skills and working together to solve problems. While they miss each other and their teachers, they knew that school was not a safe place because they could just play. I thought it would be incredibly hard to explain to a six-year-old with a learning disability why their world is turned on its head. But each took it in stride. I'm proud of the work we as a team have accomplished. I have never heard parents complain once. They kept asking questions about what more they could do and how they could help us as teachers make online learning and asynchronous activities successful. Online learning for special needs, early childhood, and English language learners can be successful. 
with the upcoming school year looming and a new group of kids and parents coming our way, I know that we ha we have conquered remote learning together, and I know that we can conquer it again. Sorry. I'm going to unmute the next person. It's, um, it looks like W.E.E. -E. Revere. Diane, do you want to? Did you bring them up or you want me to do it? I got it. Oh, it says allow to talk is not available because W.E.E. -E Revere is using an older version of Zoom. Um, um, let me, um, I'm going to promote them to panelists and then they should be able to speak. Good Ina. morning. Thank you, Dr. Kelly. This is Ina. Uh, my name is Ina Tall. I live at 100B Florence Avenue in Revere. And um, I'm a parent of a high school students at um, RHS. Uh, I am calling today, um, really it's regarding the survey that we have received. Um, I tried to complete it, but then I felt that it was um, not fair. I was giving two choices. And the one choice is to, um, if you choose remotely, then you agree to do remote for the rest of the year. And I think it is not fair. I think that we should be given the opportunity every quarters maybe or every trimester or semester to be able to reassess the situation for our children and to make the decision whether we want to send them for the next three months or four months. Um, I don't even know what next month is going to look like, let alone, you know, um, sign my daughter up for a year, um, not knowing what's going to happen. So I, I don't know if the the survey is fair or if there's another way that it can be done or maybe I misunderstood it, but I thought it was just a year was a lot to commit um, given the situation. Um, so, also, so Ina, let me just clarify on that piece. Um, so there, there are two options and what we're trying to differentiate is the parents who have already decided for whatever reason that they absolutely do not want to send their child to school this year. That's yes. one option. The second option is I will consider sending my child to school if the schools are able to return to a hybrid or in-person model. And, and that one is left to, I will consider, meaning you're not committing to doing that. You're just saying that you would like to think about it if that opportunity comes up. You could at that time um, decide that, no, you wanna stay remote. But we do know that there are some parents who have children who often for medically involved reasons um, but sometimes for other reasons, have decided that they will not send their children back to school this year. And we're trying to identify who those kids are so that we can create programs that serve their needs as well as the needs of the rest of the students who may be, well, we know we're gonna be learning remotely to start with, but maybe come back in a hybrid model later in the year. Thank you so much for clarifying that. It makes me, it puts me at ease, now I understand. Um, thank you. My other comment is, you know, regarding uh, the reopening of the schools. Uh, it was my understanding that it will be fully remote and to hear that actually some students, ELL students, special needs students, and some teachers will have to return to school. I feel like it is unfair. I feel like, you know, this is one unit. We're all in this together. Even though I don't have any of the kids in um, those classes, I feel like it is unfair, it is unsafe, it puts everybody at risk. We're all in this together. And um, so I feel like we're playing Russian roulette. Uh, even though we take all the precautions necessary, these are kids that will be in a very difficult situation to learn. Um, and is, I think that um, most of the states and cities agencies are closed at this time. People are working remotely. DESI is closed at this time, working remotely. Mm -hmm. So I just don't see why schools are being, you know, oh, um, why you're thinking about reopening the school. Um, I would implore you 
to keep everybody safe, including our teachers and the administration. And if everybody can stay you know, home until we have uh, a vaccine, I think that would be the, the best op option at this time. Thank you for giving me the time to speak. And um, yeah, that's it for today. Thank you, Mina. Um, I, Mr. Mayor, I don't know how long um, we want to continue. There are two more hands raised. Do you want to do those two and then tap it? We've been 20, a little over 20 minutes at this point. I would, uh, I would uh, ask what the will of the committee is. We, we do have four minutes. Not that I've been timing it, but we do have four minutes open. I would okay, just well, let the two speakers speak and then call it, and then that's it. Yeah. Okay. Let them. If it's, all right. It sounds like it's the will of the committee to allow the last two members who have their hands raised to speak, and then we'll cut off the um, the public speak portion of the meeting. Okay. And the next one, right. uh, Chris Yamset. Okay. And Chris, I'm also going to make a panelist. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, my name is Chris Amstutz. I live at 34 Truth Street in Revere, and I'm also a teacher at Beachmont Elementary. Um, I'll try to keep my, my comments brief. Um, I will say that when uh, Mayor Rigo and Dr. Kelly, when you had your press conference last week, I was incredibly excited and thrilled to hear you announce that we'd be starting the school year remotely. And then moments later, when you clarified that there'd be small groups of high need students going in person. I was truly shocked because if anyone's going into the building, that's hybrid, that's not remote and that's not safe. Um, you mentioned that these groups would be small in, according to Desi in 2019 to 2020 school year, Revere had 1,277 special education students on IEPs and 1,788 English learners. Of those English learners, 630 of them tested at a level one or a level two this past January, making them a uh, newcomer status. So even if only our newcomer students go into school, that's 630 students that we're talking about, notwithstanding and not counting any other students who are new to the district. Um, and that's certainly not a small group and that's certainly not safe. There's also the aspect of equity of putting the highest needs kids in the riskiest environment by having them come in person. Um, the studies have shown that people with disabilities are more likely to have underlying health conditions um, that put them at higher risk of contracting COVID-19. And then if they contract it, a higher severity of the disease. And the newcomer students often live in multi-generational homes and have family members who also don't speak English and therefore are, may not be getting the information that they need to stay safe in the time that they need to be able to use it. So even if it's physically possible to fit all these students and teachers inside of our school buildings, and even if we try our absolute hardest to make our school buildings safe, why take that risk? Why put people's lives and well-beings in serious danger when it's not necessary? I'm desperately hoping that you are all not willing to put kids' lives in danger. I believe that, and I know it's a hard decision to make. So I am asking you, and I'm pleading with you to keep our kids safe and to keep our staff safe and to keep our community safe and all of our families safe. And the only way to do that is to start remotely for everyone. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, and the, the last person we'll hear from is um, Lydian Rashida. Sorry. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Good morning, Aja. Uh, my name is Wishtan. I'm a mother of uh, a primary, like uh, a fourth grader that he's going to be Ryan in Fort River School. And I just want to add one small comment. I know that you don't have the, I will be in a minute, like Miss Stacy said, we have four minutes, so I'll make it like short. Uh, my question, like, um, I have a comment here, like for a teenager, you can 
explain to him like the, the danger of the COVID and how to prevent it and how to clean it. But for the primary, like a middle school and high school, I think it, yeah, it's possible. But like elementary, when I, when you have a five years old and six years old, it's so hard. It's so hard to explain to him. And th those like category, like prime, like elementary, I think it's, 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 it's better at least until we would find a vaccine. That's my point. Maybe I'm wrong, but like for like, like kids, like really young, young, and they will not understand. Majority of them, they will not understand the, the danger and they will do mistakes. So in order to be like safe and have our community safe, please just elementary, at least uh, until we will find a vaccine. But for middle and high school, that's my, my, my understanding. Maybe I'm wrong, but... Thank you so much for allowing me to talk and have a wonderful day. Thank you, you too. Thank you everyone for your, for your comments. Um, we're gonna move on to the next item on our agenda, which is the parent engagement policy. Um, motion to table that. Mrs. Rizzo has a motion to table that. Second. Okay. Uh, roll call. Mrs. Bronston Rizzo? Yes. Mr. D'Ambrosio? Yes. Mr. Ferranti? Yes. Ms. Gravelisi? Yes. Mr. Sanella? Ms. Ty? Yes. Mayor Rigo? Yes. So okay. Do you want to, Stacey, uh, just let people know about the meeting we have scheduled to discuss that next week? Um, yes, we have a subcommittee meeting. I, is it Wednesday, 12 noon? Yes. Okay. Okay, we'll move on to Title IX, the next uh, and, um, item on the agenda. Mr. Chair? Mrs. Rizzo. Um, and first of all, I want to thank Dr. Gallucci and our school committee council for working diligently on this policy that is required by fed, federal law. Um, and I'll leave my personal comments about it out. Um, not to do with their work about having to have this policy, um, but it is on sexual harassment. Um, this policy um, talks about the process. It also um, speaks of how we take um, record keeping. Um, also, it needs to be sent out to all the stakeholders in our district so that um, after that, all employees would receive training on it. Um, the policy subcommittee is recommending this policy to the school committee of, on the whole, and we hope that you will um, vote to adopt it. I would need a motion if someone may, and I, I am going to say this is, um, we don't have a choice to have this policy. Um, the wording and some of the extra additional things that um, Dr. Gallucci and our council put in um, is fine, but um, they are requiring us to vote on this by today, 5 p.m. Why don't you make the motion? So I will make a motion to adopt the sexual harassment policy that would be filed under our policies of ACAB. Second. Uh, roll call of the members. Mrs. Bronston Rizzo. Mrs. Rizzo. Yes. Sorry, we didn't hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. Mr. D'Ambrosio. Let me briefly preface my vote by saying that while I understand that the administration feels the need to comply with these new federal guidelines, I can't support anything that meaningfully restricts the definition of sexual assault and harassment these new guidelines will significantly uh, or make it significantly more difficult for survivors to come forward. So I vote no. Mr. Ferranti? Yes. Ms. Gravelisi? Yes. Ms. Ty? Yes. Mayor Arrigo? Yes. 
Um, we'll move on to the next item on the agenda, which is handbooks. Okay, under handbooks, um, again, our administration worked hard um, to come up with everything that we really need to identify during COVID. Um, this would be a cover page to our handbooks. Um, it will also allow for the superintendent and administration um, some leniency to adopt the policies around COVID so that they don't have to come back to us for every little policy. Um, so the policy school committee um, subcommittee is recommending that this interim policy be adopted. Second. Roll call. Mrs. Bronston Rizzo? Yes. Mr. D'Ambrosio? Yes. Mr. Ferranti? Yes. Ms. Gravelisi? Yes. Ms. Ty? Yes. Mayor Rigo? Yes. And I just wanna make a note that our handbooks have not been changed at all. Um, so right now this is a, you know one big piece on how we need to navigate it. Um, and hopefully eventually we can have council go through um, the handbooks and put what we need in and take out stuff that has gathered throughout the years that really is not necessary. But for right now, our handbooks stay the same and it's just this cover page that's being added to it. Um, and the next one is COVID policies. Um, the first one would be, hmm, it would be our guidelines to update um, the policies. The same thing, um, I don't have access to it. I'm looking. COVID pop, um, nope, that's public participation. I, I'm really sorry, I thought I had my app together for a change. Is there a specific question you have? Um, no, it's policy issues from the pandemic. And basically it's just a creation of general interim policies on COVID related issues. Right. Um, and again, the policy subcommittee had gone through that. Um, and we are recommending that this be adopted um, as an interim policy. Second. We'll call the members. Mrs. Bronston Rizzo? Yes. Mr. D'Ambrosio? Yes. Mr. Franti? Yes. Ms. Scravelisi? Yes. Ms. Ty? Yes. Mayor Rigo? Yes. And the last policy is on face coverings. And this policy is pretty much um, what we will be doing. I, I have to say the administration, it kind of ties in both. Um, Mm -hmm. It is done with the CDC guidance. Um, it addresses the exceptions to the rules. Um, it discusses the responsibility of providing face masks along with the violations of not following this policy. Um, so our policy subcommittee is recommending the adoption of this interim policy. So moved. Second. Second. Roll call the members. Mrs. Bronston Rizzo? Yes. Mr. D'Ambrosio? Yes. Mr. Ferranti? Yes. Ms. Gravelisi? Yes. Ms. Ty? Yes. Mayor Rigo? Yes. Thank Can you, the, Mr. Uh, Mayor. That's it for us on me. Thank you, Mrs. Rizzo. Thank you for all the great work that you do. Uh, the last item on the agenda is the uh, is a motion to vote uh, to meet in executive session pursuant to Mass General Law Chapter 30A, Section Section 21A, uh, for the following purpose, uh, which is I purpose think it's number seven, Mr. Mayor, on the agenda. Oh, did I did I skip over um, safer teachers, safer students? Yeah, I apologize. Yeah. So I've shared um, some of this information with the committee as we've been working on this project for about two weeks now um, in conjunction with um, the Wellesley Public Schools 
Somerville, Kelsey, uh, and Brookline Public Schools. And um, uh, the Safer Teachers, Safer Students uh, program is actually a comprehensive COVID testing program that we're hoping to stand up uh, in those five communities. Um, the initiative is being led by a number by a number of um, epidemiologists and scientists from across many of the leading uh, medical institutions in the Commonwealth. They include UMass Medical Center, the director of UMass Medical Center, uh, Tufts Medical, um, CU Medical, uh, several others. But the lead researchers are Jesse Bohm, who is an institute scientist at the Broad Institute, and um, Mira Pollack, who is the associate medical director for infectious disease. At, in the diagnostic lab at Children's Hospital. Um, and I wanted to share some of that uh, information a little bit more formally as we try to figure out ways uh, with the mayor's office to uh, make this partnership happen. So I'm gonna um, share a bit of a, of a PowerPoint here that will uh, talk a little bit about the coalition pilot um, that we're trying to get funded. And uh, funding right now is one of the biggest obstacles that we have to the program. Uh, but we have uh, begun to reach out to our elected officials to seek some financing from our state delegation. And all of the districts have started to reach out to any corporate sponsors that they think might be viable um, in helping us uh, get this moving. Um, but the idea is that we would look at, and you'll notice this is primarily targeted around Wellesley, but it's really for all five districts. Uh, but just to, as, a, as an example uh, position here, they talk about the different, the dis distinguishing the difference between scenarios for um, students when, uh, if COVID comes into a school building and how we can ensure students and teachers are safe. And so uh, what you see in the example here, the, the two, um, pink shaded members are intended to be COVID positive. Um, and if we don't have a testing program, what we are likely to see is the spread of COVID to other people who are associated with um, that student or, or teacher who tests positive. Now, obviously we're doing everything that we can to mitigate the spread if we are able to come to a hybrid uh, instructional model we don't anticipate that we're going to get back to a full in-person model this school year unless um, a vaccine becomes available, um, just because we wouldn't be able to maintain the six feet of social distancing that has been defined in our reopening plan. Um, but even so, even with six feet of social distancing and everybody wearing masks, as our protocol dictates, uh, it is possible that there could still be a spread without a testing program in, in place. Um, and so obviously that's what we want to avoid. What we want to try to build is making sure there are no infections in our schools at all. Um, and so one way to do that is with a testing program, if we had those two, two individuals who had tested positive, whether they were symptomatic or asymptomatic, we would be able to remove them from the population right away. And that would enable us to prevent the spread of uh, COVID. Now, naturally, the two, the two things that are really important in order for this to work would be to have frequent testing and to have testing of asymptomat asymptomatic um, staff and students so that we can proactively identify uh, infected individuals rather than wait for symptoms to appear and then wait for somebody to go and get tested to either have that confirmed or not. And then as testing protocols are currently sometimes that waiting period is six or seven days before they get a result. Um, obviously, if we are able to find a space where we're having a hybrid learning environment, that waiting those six or seven days to get a result, particularly if it comes back negative, um, can really be harmful to students and teachers. If we are in an environment where we can come to in-person schooling, but they're being held out of that environment for significant periods of time. Um, so this, this is what the goal would be, and what that would take is frequent testing and rapid turnaround of testing results so that we have real-time information on what's going on. And that is the program um, that we're hoping to establish 
um, to make sure that we can do this at a reasonable cost, um, we'd be looking at a couple of different testing scenarios to stand up. And I'll flip through a couple of these slides. Um, we can get to the... Um, Um, so this is talking about some of the more specifics of the type of test. It would be the um, a nasal swab test, not the not the deep test that goes far into the nasal membrane, but the one that is more near front of nose um, swabbing, which has been found to be very effective in um, identifying COVID in asymptomatic patients. Um, and we would be looking at a few different um, setups for the testing. I'm not finding the slide that I'm looking for right here. So I'm gonna go off of this, but. Um, um, so the, the different kinds of testing that we would be looking at doing is first a program for symptomatic students and staff so that if somebody is showing symptoms they could quickly get tested uh, and have a rapid turnaround to determine whether or not those symptoms are actually COVID um, or if those symptoms might be of some other uh, non-COVID related illness such as uh, a common cold or when we get into the winter months, the regular flu, um, you know, that kind of a condition. Um, we would want the frequent testing because as we know, sometimes tests don't show a positive until a person's been infected for a couple of days. So we might test somebody who comes back negative who actually has um, COVID. And the scientists and researchers that we're working with have identified one week as the appropriate time period to repeat testing. Um, there's a lot, there's a, there are a lot more details that need to be, be ironed out. The key word is how will this be funded? We anticipate the cost of the five districts in total to be around $12.5 million. Um, and so that's the sum that we are trying to raise right now. Um, we would be looking at weekly testing for all staff and for middle and high school students whose parents choose to engage them in um, the program so that they could have weekly testing. When patients are symptomatic and have health insurance, their health insurance would be billed for the test. For folks who don't have health insurance or when they're asymptomatic, which is typically not covered by insurance, um, that's where the $12.5 million comes from. Those are the funds that would be expected to pay for that testing. Um, the research scientists have identified already two lab partners who have expressed interest in working with us. Um, they have uh, tentatively agreed to provide the testing program at cost rather than at a premium, which is what happens when you go to um, Minute Clinic or uh, even if you go to one of the other places that's charged by insurance, often the, the, test, the test charge for your insurance is about $125 to $160. In fact, the true cost of the test is between $45 and $65. And the labs have agreed that they would uh, work with us on that at-cost at pricing and that they would um, promise a less than 24-hour turnaround on the results so that we could act on things very quickly. So it's a lot of information uh, about a program that is not yet certain, but something that we are hoping uh, we'll be able to partner and engage in. Um, we're going to continue to work with the rest of the districts and um, our research scientist partners at Broad and um, UMass Medical and, and the other facilities that I mentioned uh, to try to fit, raise the funds and try to bring this program to Revere. And uh, with that, I will take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Kelly. Uh, members have any questions? I see Mrs. Rizzo's hand up. Um, we'll start with you, Mrs. Rizzo. I just want to say I am so excited to have the opportunity to work with the Broad Institute. Um, they are the think tank that the governor has been working with for his Stop the Spread program. And I think it's going to be a great benefit to Revere Public Schools. It's, and 
almost like um, an extra layer of um, hopefulness when it comes to um, COVID and um, how everyone is just so scared about I, just in Rivera alone, the numbers that keep going up. I think the public schools to be working with this group is a great opportunity to stop the spread. So thank you to Dr. Kelly and anyone else that has been involved in it. I really do appreciate it. Thank you, Mrs. Rizzo. Uh, Ms. Ty. Uh, I, I want to repeat uh, Mrs. Rizzo's accolades. Um, uh, certainly great thanks to the superintendent and to you, Mr. Mayor, for the many hours. I don't know how you go without sleep, so <laughs> because you have put so many hours into it. Uh, Dr. Kelly, uh, you said it's less than, less than certain. Um, if you had to give odds about, our, uh, about whether we would get it or not, uh, could you place odds on that? <laughs> Well, I know that um, the mayor is very much dedicated to the project and has pledged to work uh, with us with some of his, some of the city's CARES Act funding. Um, the school department's CARES Act funding has all been allocated for uh, PPE and technology and uh, building work, uh, custodians be cleaning all that. Yes. But the mayor has pledged some of the city's CARES Act funding for the program. We did have a preliminary meeting with um, Amazon yesterday to, to gauge their interest in doing some, um, I forget the term that you use, Brian, when um, the companies give back to the city. Um, I, I mean, I would say, uh, you know, potential partnership, you know, yeah. with with our uh, corporate partners. And, you know, yeah. we've, we're, we're looking at every kind of avenue and option um, to, to make this a reality. Yeah, and I know that the other districts are doing the same. Um, some of them like Wellesley and Brookline and even Somerville have a little bit more uh, financial backing than uh, Riviere or Chelsea does. Um, uh, but this is a pioneering program, not only in the state of Massachusetts, but across the country. There are a number of colleges that have been able to set up programs like this, many of them partnering with uh, Broad. And um, this would be the first uh, in the K-12 arena in the nation. And uh, some of the doctors, as I mentioned, who are working on this are uh, very well known, not only nationally, but internationally in their field. Um, so they're leveraging uh, their own network and resources to try to secure some funding. Um, we, we've also prepared a letter to go to the legislature, which uh, Mr. Mayor, I'm actually, the, it's getting finalized now. When I have a final copy, I was gonna ask you to pass it on to the speaker. Um, so we, we feel confident that um, some people will look at this um, for its novelty and look at it for its innovation and understand that this could be something that could be game changing in how uh, K-12 students return to school across the country. Um, if we can find a way to restore students and parents and teachers that uh, anyone who's COVID positive is being removed from the population and do that proactively, even for asymptomatic patients, I think we can help people feel a lot more comfortable about coming back to school in person. Yes, definitely. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Tai. Any other, any other members? Okay, I, I do wanna thank uh, Dr. Kelly for her, for her work on this. Uh, she's been a driving force and, um, you know, as, as she mentioned, it's, it's really, uh, could be a, a game changer and something that um, not only the rest of the um, state, but the rest of the country looks at uh, in order to wow. put uh, families and, and, and everyone at ease about uh, students returning to the classroom. So we're, you know, we're fully supportive. Uh, we're going to find uh, every, or go through every avenue to make this happen. Um, I certainly don't want, um, uh, resources to be a or money to be a, a barrier for us to to get this up and running so we're gonna we're gonna um, make every attempt to to be able to uh, put this together all right um, the next item uh, and I apologize for jumping over that dr. Kelly 
Um, the next item and the last item on the agenda is a motion uh, and vote to meet in executive session pursuant to Mass General Law Chapter 30A, Section 21A uh, for the following purpose, which is uh, purpose three to discuss strategy with respect to negotiations around the opening and the reopening of schools and school events. So moved, Mr. Chairman. There's a second. 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 Um, can I also, and we will not be returning. You are correct, Mrs. Rizzo. I apologize right. for not mentioning that. No, uh, just the, sure. the committee will the committee will not be returning after um, it meets in executive session. Okay. Uh, roll call on the uh, on the motion. Mrs. Bronston Rizzo. Yes. Mr. D'Ambrosio. Yes. Mr. Ferranti. Yes. Ms. Gravelisi. Yes. Ms. Ty. Yes, Mayor Rigo. Yes. Okay, but with, uh, with that vote, the committee will adjourn and then and we'll meet in executive session. Thank you. And Danielle has sent you a separate link for the other meeting. Yeah. Mm-hmm.